During World War II, Australian engineers played a critical but often overlooked role in saving American supply lines in the Pacific by developing and building crucial infrastructure under extreme conditions, by constructing and repairing airfields, roads, bridges, and harbor facilities they enabled the United States to launch its island-hopping campaign against Japan and maintain a steady flow of troops, equipment, and supplies. June 25, 1942. Milne Bay, Papua New Guinea. A convoy pulls into the harbor. American engineers pour off the ships. Their orders are clear. Build an airstrip. Fast. The Japanese are coming. These Americans have equipment. Bulldozers graders, everything they need. But they have a problem. They do not know the terrain. They have never worked in tropical conditions, and they are about to discover that New Guinea is unlike anywhere on Earth. Then they meet the Australians, the 24th Field Company, Australian sappers who have been fighting since 1940, men who know mud, who know rain, who know how to build in hell. Together, these Australian and American engineers are about to perform a miracle. They will build three airstrips in swampland that experts said was impossible. They will keep supply lines open through jungles that swallow roads overnight. And they will do it while being bombed every single day. This is the story of how Australian engineers saved America's supply lines in the Pacific, how they built victory from mud and steel, and how they did it so well that nobody remembers it happened. Let me paint you a picture of Milne Bay in 1942. It sits at the eastern tip of Papua New Guinea, a bay surrounded by mountains and jungle, beautiful in peacetime, a nightmare for war. The ground is swamp. Five meters of rain fall every year. That is not a typo. Five meters. When it rains, and it always rains, the ground turns into liquid mud. Vehicles sink up to their axles. Men wade through knee-deep muck. Roads disappear overnight. This is where MacArthur wants an airbase. This is where Australian and American engineers have to work magic. The American 43rd Engineer Regiment arrives with all the right equipment, but none of the experience. The Australian 24th Field Company has the opposite. They have experience, but barely any equipment. Their tools are basic. Shovels, picks, hand saws. But what they have is knowledge. Three years of fighting in North Africa taught them how to work in impossible conditions and they are about to teach the Americans everything. The first problem is the mud itself. You cannot just pour concrete on swamp. It will sink. You cannot just lay metal matting. It will disappear into the muck within days. The Australians show the Americans an old trick. Corduroy roads, cut down coconut logs, lay them side by side across the mud. Cover them with crushed coral from the beach. It works. Not perfectly but it works. The roads hold just long enough to move equipment, just long enough to get supplies through. Then you rebuild them because the rain washes everything away. Every single night, this becomes the routine. Build during the day. Repair at night. Sleep when you can, which is almost never. The Americans have never seen anything like this. In training back in the States, you build something and it stays built. Here, nothing stays built. The jungle eats everything. Vines grow through equipment overnight. Rust forms on tools in hours. Termites devour wooden structures. The Americans are learning that this is not engineering. This is survival with tools. But the Australians have another lesson to teach. How to work under fire. On August 4, 1942, Japanese bombers hit Milne Bay. The airstrip is not even finished yet, but the Japanese know what is being built. They attack. Bombs fall across the construction site. Engineers dive for cover in trenches barely deep enough to hide a man. The raid lasts minutes, 
but feels like hours. When it ends, the Australians climb out and go back to work. Just like that. The Americans are shaken. Some are wounded. But the Australians show them what to do. You work during the day despite the threat because the work has to get done. You listen for aircraft engines. When you hear them, you run for cover. When the raid ends, you go back to work. No drama, no discussion, just survival. Within days, the Americans are doing the same thing. They learn fast because they have to. The Japanese bomb Milne Bay almost every day through August and September, sometimes multiple times a day. The engineers keep working. They finish the first airstrip by early August just in time for the RAAF Kitty Hawks to arrive. Those fighters will win the Battle of Milne Bay because they have a runway to fly from. A runway built by Australian and American engineers working in a swamp while being bombed. That runway saves lives. It changes the course of the war. And it was built in weeks, not months. But the engineers do not stop there. They build two more airstrips at Milne Bay. They build wharves so supply ships can dock. They build storage facilities for ammunition and fuel. They build roads connecting everything together. And they do it all in conditions that would stop modern construction companies cold. Then comes the next challenge, keeping the supply lines open. After the victory at Milne Bay, Allied forces push north toward Buna and Gona. The problem is getting supplies to the front lines. There are no roads through the jungle, no railroads, no easy routes. Everything has to be carried or flown. The engineers build a network of supply dumps connected by rough tracks through the jungle. Australian sappers work alongside American construction battalions. They cut trails, build bridges over rivers that flood every time it rains construct corduroy roads through swamps, move supplies forward day and night. The Japanese bomb the supply lines constantly. They know if they can cut Allied logistics, the offensive will fail. But the engineers keep the supplies moving. When a bridge gets bombed, they rebuild it. When a road washes out, they rebuild it. When a supply dump burns, they move it and rebuild it. This is the war nobody sees. No glory, no medals. Just mud and exhaustion and endless work. Here is what makes the Australian engineers special. They improvise. American engineers follow the manual. Do it by the book. That works great back in America where you have all the materials and time. In New Guinea, you have neither. The Australians teach the Americans to make do. No steel, use bamboo. No concrete? Use crushed coral mixed with whatever you can find. No heavy equipment? Use manpower and ingenuity. The Australians built a bridge across a swollen river using nothing but ropes, logs, and determination. The Americans watched and learned. By the end of 1942, American engineers are building things the Australian way. Fast. Functional. Good enough to work even if it would never pass inspection back home. That adaptability saves lives. It keeps the supply lines open when everything says they should fail. Let me tell you about one specific moment. December 1942. The battle for Buna is raging. American and Australian infantry are dying trying to take Japanese bunkers. They need artillery support but the big guns cannot get forward because there is no road strong enough to carry their weight. Australian engineers from the Second Six Field Company work for 72 hours straight. They build a road through swamp that experts said was impossible. They use coconut logs, crushed coral, and sheer stubbornness. The road holds just long enough for the artillery to get forward. Those guns break the Japanese defenses at Buna. The infantry takes the position. Lives are saved because engineers built an impossible road. Nobody remembers their names. Nobody gave them medals. 
They just did the job and moved on to the next impossible task. Then there is the Dobodura Airfield Complex. Built between December 1942 and early 1943, it becomes one of the most important air bases in the Pacific. Fifteen airstrips at its peak. American bombers flying missions against Rabaul. Fighters providing cover for ground troops. Transport planes bringing in supplies and evacuating wounded. All of it depends on engineers keeping those runways operational. The Japanese bombed Dobodura constantly, sometimes four times in one night. Craters appear in the runways. The engineers fill them before dawn, every single time. Because if the bombers cannot take off, soldiers die. If the fighters cannot fly, troops get overrun. The engineers understand this. They work through exhaustion, through fear, through conditions that break men, and they keep the runways open. American pilots owe their lives to Australian and American engineers they never meet. Soldiers on the ground owe their lives to supply lines kept open by engineers they never see. By mid-1943, the tide has turned. Allied forces are pushing the Japanese back across New Guinea. Every advance depends on logistics. Engineers build forward airstrips so fighters can reach the front. They build supply depots, repair damaged bridges, clear roads through jungle, construct wharves for landing craft. All of it unglamorous. All of it essential. The partnership between Australian and American engineers becomes seamless. They work side by side, share techniques, cover for each other when one unit is exhausted. The Australians teach practical jungle engineering. The Americans bring industrial-scale equipment and organization. Together, they accomplish things neither could do alone. That is the real story. Not just Australian engineers helping Americans, but two nations learning from each other, building something greater together. Here is what kills me about this story. Almost nobody knows it happened. After the war, people remember the infantry battles. The pilots who shot down enemy planes, the commanders who planned the campaigns, but the engineers who made it all possible are forgotten. No movies are made about men building roads in the rain. No monuments honor the sappers who kept supply lines open. Yet without them, everything else fails. Infantry cannot fight without ammunition. Planes cannot fly without runways. Wounded cannot be evacuated without roads. The engineers are the foundation of victory. And they are forgotten. Australian engineers especially. Because the American story dominates Pacific War history, American engineers get mentioned in passing, but the Australians who taught them how to survive in New Guinea are invisible. The 24th Field Company, the 2nd 6th Field Company, the dozens of other Australian engineer units. They deserve to be remembered. They saved American lives by keeping supply lines open. They saved American operations by building airfields that experts said were impossible. They did it without complaint, without recognition, just because it needed to be done. So here is what I want you to remember. The Pacific War was not just won by fighters and bombers. It was won by engineers in the mud, by men who built victory one road at a time, one bridge at a time, one airstrip at a time. Australian and American engineers working together, learning from each other, saving each other. That partnership built the foundation for every Allied victory in New Guinea, every airfield, every supply line, every impossible road through the jungle, built by forgotten men who deserve to be remembered. The next time you hear about World War II in the Pacific, think about the engineers. Think about the Australian sappers who taught American construction troops how to survive. Think about the men who worked through rain, mud, bombs, and exhaustion to keep the war machine running. 
They are Australia's forgotten engineers who saved America's supply lines. And their story deserves to be told.